This is Every Single Saint. Hello and welcome to episode three of Every Single Saint, the podcast where we learn the lives and hear stories about every single saint. We are almost to the end. Just kidding, we just started. We are not even to 10 saints yet, and there are thousands. So this is going to be a big project, and I'm glad you are here with us to listen, and we're going to dive right into the first one of today. So next we have St. Elizabeth of the Visitation. So Elizabeth, the word used in the gospel says she is the relative of Mary. When you look that up, you see aunt sometimes. Sometimes you see cousin. For some reason, before going into this research, I think I always assumed that she was Mary's cousin. But then some say she also might have been Anne's first cousin. So that means she would have been Mary's first cousin once removed. And that Jesus to Elizabeth would have been first cousin twice removed. So I guess we're unsure how she's related to Mary. We just know that she is. So in Luke chapter one, Elizabeth enters and it says that she is a descendant of Aaron and says that she and her husband, Zechariah, were both righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And after this, we will get to Zechariah, where we will hear more of the story of the angel visiting him and telling him that Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to be blessed with a baby. But I'm going to fast forward here with Elizabeth to the visitation. So in the Gospel of Luke, it says, In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town. Judean? Judean? One of those Bible word towns, people, places that I'm not sure the pronunciation. Judea. I know it's Judea, right? But I don't know. Do you say Judean? I don't know. She went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So it sounds like Elizabeth lives in the hills. Elizabeth of the hills should be a new title for her. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Love the visitation. Really beautiful story. Catholics often, you'll hear us pray from verse 42, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, using that scripture there. And that, as I mentioned when discussing Mary, Elizabeth is the first to call her the mother of the Lord. So the last time that Elizabeth is mentioned is at John the Baptist's birth. Relatives were all sitting around asking what John the Baptist was going to be named. And is he going to be named after his father, Zechariah? And Elizabeth says, no, his name is John. And we will get to more of that story later. Elizabeth's feast day is November 5th in the Catholic Church and September 5th in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Lutheran Church and the Anglican Church. She's the patron saint of pregnant women. So all pregnant women everywhere, we lift you up in prayer. Lord God, our creator, I pray that we look to you the way that Elizabeth looked upon the womb of Mary and was so excited to be in the presence of Jesus. I pray that whenever we encounter Jesus, we leap for joy and we are so ecstatic and thankful for any opportunity that we have to experience you. I pray that we experience you more deeply every day. And I pray that as soon as we hear the sound of any of your greetings, we leap for joy. Amen. St. Elizabeth, pray for us. So next we have Zechariah, who you probably thought we were going to get to after Elizabeth. Zechariah is the husband to Elizabeth, and he is also the father of John the Baptist. So in the Gospel of Luke, we're still in Luke, an angel appears to Zechariah and says, hey, Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And Z says, you know, are you sure? Because 
she's super old. And the angel was like, yes, I'm sure. And for questioning me, you can't speak until the baby comes. So I feel like the rest of the pregnancy was difficult. So when looking at this scripture, it's really interesting because the same angel, this is the angel Gabriel also appears to Mary and says, hey, Mary, you're going to have a baby. So we get two quick stories of an angel appearing to someone and saying, hey, you're going to have a baby. What's interesting in the story about Mary is that Mary says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answers her question and says, oh, the Holy Spirit, God's all powerful. We can do that. So when looking at this, Zechariah says, how can I know this? Because Elizabeth is really, really, really old. And Mary says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? They both ask a question after being told there's going to be a baby. And the angel rebukes Zechariah and says, you know what? Shut your mouth. Literally, he makes him so that he can't talk. And to Mary, he just answers the question. And the difference that I feel like I'm picking up here is that there's a difference between asking a question because you don't believe what you're being told. And then there's, you do believe, you're just curious, you know, some of the details of how it's going to happen. Zechariah's response is translated more literally, according to what will I know this? And Mary's is more like, I believe you. I just don't know how. And so I'd like to know if you're willing to tell me. So that leads me to believe that we should trust God first and then ask questions. And our trust should not hinge on the answer to our questions the way that Zechariah's was. So Zechariah couldn't speak, which again, sure, that made the pregnancy super great. And when the baby was born, the relatives wanted him to be named after Zechariah, but Elizabeth said, nope, his name's going to be John. And the relatives were like, lady, no one in your family is named John, which I guess at the time, really important to name someone after a family member. But Zechariah got a writing tablet and wrote on the writing tablet, his name is John. And that is when his tongue was untied and he was able to speak again. And that's all we get of Zechariah. His feast day is September 5th in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's September 5th in the Lutheran Church and September 23rd in the Roman Catholic Church. Father, I pray that you teach and guide us to trust you first and not need the answers to our questions to have trust. And so just help us and guide us to grow in our trust in you in every area of our life. Today, I pray that myself and whoever is listening to this on whatever day, find a way to trust in you more and find some area of our life in which we can grow in our trust for you because you are all-knowing and all-powerful and we truly truly love you and truly want the will of god in our lives saint zechariah pray for us And so now we are going to talk about St. John the Baptist, another popular character from the Gospels. John the Baptist is the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. So we know that he is related to Jesus. We are not exactly sure how, if they are second cousins or once removed, twice removed, however it may be, unsure. So previous recap in Luke, an angel appears to Zechariah, says Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And Zechariah is like, are you sure? Because she's super old. And the angel is like, yes, I'm sure. And the angel was sure. And that's exactly what happened. Elizabeth did have a baby. And the name of John. So John the Baptist is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that someone would be coming to be the messenger to make way for Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of many, 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 many Old Testament prophecies. It's one of the reasons we know that there's truth behind him being the Messiah, him being the Christ. And one of those is that there's going to be a messenger to come before Jesus and make way. In the Gospel of Mark, we are told that St. John the Baptist, by the time that he was doing his ministry, which came shortly before Jesus, he lived out in the wild and he wore camel hair 
and he ate locusts. If you're ever wondering what is a locust, you probably know it's a bug. It's basically a grasshopper. So yeah, he ate grasshoppers. And he ate oh, he also ate wild honey. Not tame honey, wild honey. And he's also the one that baptizes Jesus. John the Baptist, the baptizer, really made baptism super popular. And so did Jesus, and so did Christianity. It is a very popular discussion in Christian theology. So what I'm going to dive into when it comes to John the Baptist is his death story, which is kind of a bummer, but also an interesting story. And it starts with Herod the Great. And Herod the Great, if you remember, is not that great. He is the one who killed the Holy Innocents. So, yep. And he also had lots and lots of wives. And so hopefully you can keep up because I'm going to dive into some of these wives and their sons because it all leads to this story with John the Baptist. So Herod the Great first had a wife named Doris who had a son named Antipater. And then Herod had another wife named Miriam. But we're going to call her Miriam I. And Miriam I had two sons. And one of those sons had a woman named Herodias. So we're going to try to remember that. Miriam, two sons, one of them Herodias. So Herodias, his grandmother is Miriam I. Miriam I's family, they're called the Hasmonians. They attempted treason against Herod the Great and tried to murder him. Herod the Great did not like that and killed both of his sons and Miriam. So then he found another Miriam. Yes, he married another Miriam named Miriam II and had a son with her, that son named Herod the Second not Herod the Great, who really wasn't great. As remember, as I mentioned earlier, Herodias was not killed, actually, and Herod the Great kind of adopted her because he did kill her father and uncle and grandmother. And so, as I just mentioned, Herod II was born from Miriam II, and Herod married Herodias to Herod II. Okay, so Herodias is married to Herod II at this point. Interestingly, just like Miriam I, Miriam II was also involved in a plot to overthrow Herod. But this time, Herod is nice and doesn't kill her. He just leaves her. So because Herod leaves Miriam II, Herod II, who's married to Herodias, is removed from the line of succession. So Herodias, who I guess is a go-getter, wants to be married to someone who's in the line of succession. And so she figures out a way to divorce Herod to Herod II, and instead marries a different son of Herod from a different marriage. I didn't even get into all the marriages. Um, Herod Antipas, who eventually is king during Jesus's ministry. So Herod the Great eventually dies. Rule goes to Herod Antipas. Herodias left Herod II, instead married Herod Antipas, who's now ruler and king. In comes John the Baptist. Herod Antipas liked John the Baptist and heard, you know, he liked listening to him and heard interesting things about him. It was like, this guy, you know. However, John the Baptist, he was just like, hey, you can't be married to your brother's wife because that's not okay and that's unlawful. And Herodias, who's the now wife of Herod Antipas, is like, hey, you can't tell me what to do, even though John the Baptist was super right about this. So Herodias, because she knew that John the Baptist did not like that they were married, Herodias wanted him dead and was like, hey, we should kill him. Herod was like, no, I don't want to kill him. I like him. Except different gospels seem to indicate different things on whether or not Herod actually did or did not want to kill him. But the story we get is that on Herod's Herod's having a birthday party and Herodias' daughter comes to dance for Herod. And so Herod and the birthday guests are all watching this dance and they think it's great. And Herod says, you know what, daughter, I'm going to give you anything that you want. It's my birthday. I'm going to make an oath and give you anything you want. So the daughter is now caught up in way more than she probably expected. I was like, I don't know. So she asks her mom, hey, what should I ask for? And Herodias says, oh, little sweet darling, ask for a decapitated head on a platter. And not just any head, John the Baptist. Great thing to ask for. So that's exactly what she does. Daughter says, hey, 
Dad, I want the head of John the Baptist. And Herod, who made an oath in front of everyone, was like, oh, shoot. So that's what he does. He has John the Baptist beheaded, and he puts the head on a platter and gives it to the little girl, who gives it to the mother, who does I don't know what with it. And then John's followers put his body in a tomb. And this is interesting foreshadowing for John making the way for Jesus. He was arrested and killed and then put in a tomb. So that is the story of how John the Baptist died. And the backstory behind Herod and his wacko family is pretty interesting. Yeah, we think that he died maybe around 30 AD. His feast day, he has a couple of feast days actually, because we celebrate the feast of his nativity too on June 24th and his beheading on August 29th. So God, we come before you today inspired by the life of John the Baptist. And just as John prepared the way for Jesus by living humbly in the wilderness and calling for repentance, help us to prepare our hearts for your presence. Grant us the courage to speak out against injustice and proclaim your truth, even when it might be unpopular. Like John, we confess our sins and seek your cleansing forgiveness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be vessels of light, guiding others towards the path of righteousness and salvation. May we, like John, point others to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In your holy name we pray, amen. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. Thank you for listening to episode three. After episode three is episode four. Might as well go there. If it's already out, give it a listen. If it's not out, then it'll be out very soon. Um, please find us on Instagram, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you so much for being a listener. Patron saint of the podcast, St. Nicholas, pray for us.